Good afternoon. I'm Josh Gladstone from the Informed Student Chapter here at the University of Amherst, Massachusetts. Today I'm joined by Dr. Ina Ganguly. Uh, Dr. Ganguly is Professor of Economics in the Economics and Management Department here at UMass. She is also currently Director of the UMass Computational Sciences, Social Sciences Institute. Uh, her primary research areas are labor economics and the economics of science and innovation. Her recent research has focused on the migration of scientists, gender disparities in the labor market, and the formation of scientific collaborations. She is a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, an affiliate, a um, research fellow at the Institute of Labor Economics, an affiliate researcher at the Stockholm Institute of Transition Economics, and a an, uh, faculty associate at both the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies and the Laboratory for Innovation Sciences at Harvard University. She holds a PhD from Harvard University, a master's in public policy from the University of Michigan, and a Bachelor of Arts from Northwestern University. She, hold, she was a Fulbright scholar in Ukraine in 2004 and has served as a U.S. Embassy Policy Specialist Fellow in Russia, Azerbaijan, and Tajikistan. It is a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Gingley. Thank you for having me. Sure. So let's get into the questions. Um, mm -hmm. As an economist specializing in the economics of uh, science and innovation, what initially drew you to the study of the impacts of war, crisis, and conflict on scientific communities? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I didn't actually originally plan to study, uh, you know, how science and scientists react or mm -hmm. how they're impacted by war, but um, I spent a lot of time, actually, my dissertation uh, working on uh, the Soviet Union and understanding uh, what happened to science and scientists mm -hmm. after the end of the Soviet Union uh, during the 1990s. So that was a big economic crisis. And why it was interesting because, uh, you know, during crises and, and kind of large shocks like a war, um, things change very suddenly. And so you can kind of look at how people respond or mm. how um, research changes or how publishing changes. And so I had looked at the 1990s and how the economic crisis in the former Soviet Union um, impacted, you know, people's decisions to migrate um, how it impacted, you know, who stayed in science. Mm -hmm. And so as an economist, again, it's an interesting time to, you know, even though it's very hard for the individuals and a challenging time, but it, um, you know, allows you to look at changes in behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and so I spent a lot of time in, in the former Soviet Union, um, particularly in Ukraine. And, you know, as you mentioned, I did a Fulbright there. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, when the war started, um, you know, I realize like, you know, yeah, this is going to impact everyone and it's going to have implications for science and innovation. And so um, just about a year ago, so now the full scale invasion, uh, you know, started about two years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, about a year ago, I started working with another scholar who had worked on science innovation um, at, after World War II. Mm -hmm. um, so he had done a lot of work, um, you know, on about what happened in, in Germany and Jewish scientists who left. And so we teamed up uh, with our expertise to kind of uh, try to understand what has happened to science in Ukraine a year after the full-scale uh, invasion. So that was about a year ago. And now, you know, there's um, still going on the war. And so, uh, you know, continuing to kind of think about what the impacts are and, hope, and trying to, to help too, if, you know, uh, sure. in different ways. Sure. Very good. Yeah. Um, so your research is focused on gender disparities in the labor market. Uh, how do wars and crises exacerbate these disparities within the scientific fields? And what strategies can be employed uh, to mitigate them? Right. So this is a question, an important question, I think. Um, I actually haven't studied it yet. Uh, um, but we can already start to see um, that, you know, men and women are impacted differently during a war. And so, um, yeah, we know there's a lot of gender differences in science. So which fields men and women are in, uh, what they study. Um, we see differences in publication patterns, um, you know, due to things like having children that maybe impact, you know, women more than men. Um, and so if we go to a setting where there's war and conflict, 
Um, there are a number of things that can be going on that might impact these differences. And so I think the starkest is um, in Ukraine right now, for example, there's martial law. And so men who are between the ages of 18 and 60 are uh, basically not allowed to leave the country. Right. And, um, you know, there's, you know, many men who've gone to, to fight, uh, you know, women too. Um, but, you know, the big way that it's uh, impacting men and women differently is women scholars and scientists are able to leave. And so a lot of these programs to help Ukrainian scientists mm -hmm. to uh, leave Ukraine, go abroad, um, it's the women who are the ones who are, who are able to, to, to do that. Um, now, that being said, how does that impact the science they do? Well, it can actually help them do more science, but also leaving your country is also a big shock. You know, it's a big transition. Like there's a cost to it. So it might actually um, be harder for women to continue to do science then. Uh, you know, on the other hand, too, for those who stay in Ukraine, um, women, you know, we know from literature also tend to take on um, a larger share of, you know, child rearing and household duties. And you can imagine during a war, there are services, for example, like education, right, for children. Um, you're hearing that in some cases where there's a lot of, you know, uh, conflict or, you know, there's um, safety concerns when uh, the students aren't going to school. So they're mm -hmm. learning remotely. So mm -hmm. you can imagine maybe women who are doing science, but they now have to shift towards um, taking care of children more. So that can also kind of then create more gender disparities. So again, it's, it's a good question, not one, you know, I haven't studied this, not one I've looked at carefully yet, mm -hmm. but um, but I think it's an important one. And I think there's a lot of kind of nuances to think about what we would expect. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, and so given your background as a Fulbright scholar in Ukraine and your extensive research on scientific collaborations, um, have you observed uh, the Ukrainian scientific community? How, how have they been able to adapt and respond to the challenges posed by Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the word that comes to mind is resilience, that, you know, it's already been two years since the full-scale invasion, but you're seeing that you know, people are continuing to do their research, even in, you know, very, um, you know, terrible conditions. So, you know, there's been a lot of universities and, you know, um, lab, uh, you know, institutes and labs that mm -hmm. have been destroyed, have faced uh, destruction. Um, and then, you know, throughout the country, even in places maybe that, where there hasn't been as much damage, you know, kind of damage to the physical building, um, there's a lot of psychological stress, right? Mm -hmm. And um, anxiety, people have had to make hard decisions, whether that they should leave, leave their families or stay. Um, but despite that, you know, people are, you know, pushing on, doing research, involved in international collaborations, trying to get help, you know, for scientists in Ukraine. Um, and, you know, I think what we're um, seeing, too, is there's a shift, and this is something that I've studied, is there was a history of uh, collaboration, scientific collaboration with Russia, and they were very integrated. And now I think this, the full-scale invasion in 2022 was really kind of a turning point where you see in the data already big drop in collaboration with Russian scientists. Um, and we're starting to see that, um, you know, there's kind of more collaborations going on, uh, particularly also with due to funding programs and, and other support for, for Ukrainian scientists. So um, so I think that's been a change and hopefully, you know, something that will continue in the future. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so international scientific cooperation is often hindered during times of conflict like this. Um, what strategies or policies have you identified as effective in maintaining or even fostering collaboration between scientists and researchers from different nations? Yeah, no, that's, um, I think, an important question. And I think that's one thing, as I said, we are already seeing changes in the way, you know, international collaboration, Ukrainian scientists with others, um, how that's evolving. And, you know, I think one thing that's been important is uh, grant programs, so particularly, you know, funding programs that um, help Ukrainian scientists continue to do their research, um, especially uh, programs that allow Ukrainians who are still in Ukraine as well, you know, to do their research as well as those who have left. Um, and, you know, I think the idea that even a small amount of funding can make a difference um, and can bring, um, you know, teams together um, is something that I think, you know, you can see uh, is mattering. Now, um, 
you know, I think going, we're at a point now again, two years later. So, you know, those programs, some of them are coming to a close, um, you know, some new ones are starting, but I think, you know, given that this is unfortunately kind of, you know, it's, it's been a long time, uh, you know, how it's, it's, it's going on longer than people thought, um, mm-hmm. I think kind of more attention to this. So I will say UMass has um, a virtual scholars program with the Kiev School of Economics. And, you know, it's an example of, um, you know, a program that again, it, is helping Ukrainian scholars who are in Ukraine, you know, continue to do research, but it then fosters the collaboration with U.S., you know, U.S. Uh, scholars. And, you know, I, for example, am working on a project with someone, uh, Maxim Obrazan at the Kiev School of Economics. And, um, you know, I can really see that it's, uh, it's a great opportunity for us to work on a research project together, actually about the impacts of, of war and conflict on science Um, And so those programs, I think, are really um, key in fostering collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. And it's great what you said and in your talk earlier that even a small amount of money uh, to a lot of different scientists can make a huge difference over time, um, as opposed to maybe larger research grants to just a very few. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's a great point. Yeah. Thank you. Um, How do you see the findings from your research informing policy decisions aimed at supporting scientific communities in conflict-affected uh, regions like Ukraine mm-hmm. and also globally. Right. Yeah, so I think um, you know one thing that I've uh, learned now looking at the literature, because again, I, I wasn't planning to work really on war and conflict, um, but now I've have had an opportunity to kind of look at, you know, what do we know, especially from the economics and science innovation literature. And I'd say, you know, a lot of the um, literature is primarily from World War II, uh, also a bit from World War I, but there's kind of a lot that we could still learn. And um, so I think the piece that um, you know, I've been working on mo- most recently re- related to Ukraine is you know, again, how international collaborations change and, and co-authorship, um, but also migration. So we know that during wars, um, there's a lot of mobility, right? So as people decide to leave or return. Um, and so I think that um, you know one important policy going forward um, is that, you know, we know from other literatures that when a lot of people leave a country, uh, it can be really, you know, detrimental to kind of the long run, um, you know, production of knowledge and then the long run, you know, um, you know science sector in, that, in mm-hmm. that country. And so it'll be really important how in the future, um, you know, whether there are funding programs, for example, to, uh, you know, help people who want to return to Ukraine, say scientists that have left. Um, I think that's going to be important. Um, But also thinking about those um, international collaborations that formed, how to continue to support those so that they um, continue to be a channel through which Ukraine's uh, science uh, community can kind of be connected to the the world and be sustained. So I'd say that would be, um, yeah, one of the most important things, I think, to, to think about. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, So last question, Uh, looking towards the future, um, what are some potential research avenues or areas of focus uh, that emerge from your current work on the impacts of war, crisis, and conflict on science and innovation? Yeah, so I think um, there's a few things I think that have uh, you know, have emerged from as I've been looking, you know, at the literature and working in this area that I think would be um, really important going forward. And I think the first one is what we were just, uh, you know, talking about, which is about migration. So we know that there's a lot of movement of people, particularly when a war starts, um, but it's very challenging uh, to be able to see that in the data, right? So, you know, how do you measure how many people have left a country when there's a war? It's very, it's difficult during peacetime, right? But especially during a war. Um, and so, you know, kind of thinking through what are the types of data that we need? So is it surveys? And, you know, surveys are one way to try to understand how many people have left. Um, or, you know, again, like the challenges people are facing or what are, you know, the, um, the, yeah, the experiences that they're having. Um, but we know that there's problems with surveys because of who responds, that there can be a selective response. Um, and so thinking creatively about other ways to measure mobility. So, you know, a lot of my work is with publication data and trying to see, you know, once people publish, can we track their affiliations in their papers that allow us to track mobility and kind of measure who's left, who stayed. Um, but even then thinking about, well, what other data could be collected or 
Um, there's something called ORCID, um, ORCID IT, I think, um, which, you know, are other ways to think about scientists self-reporting what country they're in. So that's another way to kind of, you know, get at, um, you know, the, the location of the scientists. So, um, so I think that's one area. Just thinking about measurement is, I think, really important. Um, but then also thinking about, yeah, these questions of, like, what programs and policies are helpful um, to you know, ensure that Ukraine can kind of benefit also from the people who've left, right? So what are the ways to engage uh, the this, this scientists who've left Ukraine so that, you know, Ukraine can kind of, again, um, may, you know, be um, in the long run, um, you know, productive and, and, and during reconstruction have, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, growth, economic growth, essentially. Um, so I see that the second thing. Um, and then the third thing that I think is, you know, very important and interesting is this question of who um, becomes a scientist during a crisis or a conflict. So right now, you know, it's um, a big shock, right, to the economy. And people are, you know, making choices about what to do with their time, right? Where, you know, whether to study, whether to go fight, what to study, and what this next generation, you know, the next generation does, um, you know, how are their choices about whether to kind of enter science or engineering, I think is an important one. And one thing that, you know, I'm starting to look into that's very interesting is, um, you know, who, you know, there's a lot of um, innovation happening around drones mm -hmm. and other technologies. And there's a lot of interest because, you know, I think people, you know, the, the thing that's unifying Ukrainians, is they, they want the war to end, right? They want um, the Russians to leave. And, um, you know, having that purpose of like, you know, we're trying to create technologies that will help our country, I think is, you know, um, a motivation that is, you know, very unique during a war. And so, um, again, if we think through what we would expect, like, you know, you might think, oh, people aren't going to be doing science and engineering during a war, but actually it's a way to help the country. So I think it's an interesting question about what motivations people have mm -hmm. and how that can impact their, um, you know, career paths as well. Sure. Thank you. Well, it's an extremely rich and fascinating area of research. Um, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Thanks.